Okay, welcome once again to uh, this edition of LPAC Shorts, our ongoing series of short, uh, relatively short videos to discuss uh, what it takes to return America to an industrial and manufacturing powerhouse again, or what we at LaRouche PAC have been calling re-Americanizing the U US economy, uh, which also implies that uh, the US will then be able to pay a, play a positive role in the world uh, for economic development. So we have with us once again, Brian Lance, a longtime associate of Lyndon LaRouche, an economic researcher who's written quite extensively on the economy, done tremendous research and is keeping up on that subject. So today we wanna to take up the subject of machine tools, uh, which is a vital part of uh, everybody's economy and the world economy, but especially the United States. Uh, and uh, Brian has an update for us on it. So Brian, why don't you begin by uh, telling our, our viewers, you know, what are machine tools and why are they so important to the economy? Well, I think first, uh, machine tools are the master machines. They're the machines with which you build all other machines. That's their, that's their purpose. Um, and because of that, they're also the means by which new breakthroughs in science and technology are translated into the productive process. Uh, you've got to apply those new conceptions. Uh, and in the design of science experiments, the scientific experiments that prove new physical principles, for example, uh, those very science experiments, as Lyndon LaRouche has pointed out, uh, are really the outline of a machine tool. And, uh, uh, and sometimes it's the same people involved. They design uh, an initial machine tool. Uh, and, uh, and then you go from there. So, uh, so it's not only critical in terms of producing today, it's even more important in terms of producing tomorrow, our tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of, of, of how that process works? Well, a simple example would be uh, electricity. I mean, I think I've mentioned it before. Others have uh, been, uh, Bob Ingram did a whole series on Ben Franklin, but uh, from the point of developing, uh, you know, a, a breakthrough in terms of conception of electricity, that lightning was the same thing in essence uh, as, as what you get when you uh, move your hand across the fur of a cat, you know, uh, that uh, from there to the development of uh, electrical power uh, in terms of telegraphs and so forth, and then to uh, electric motors. I mean, those are gigantic leaps which meant the development of entirely new insights into how to apply productively what was a, a scientific breakthrough made back uh, before the American Revolution. So the steps from the discovery of electricity to its application as a economic process in the terms of the development of electric motors and so forth. Sure. But the today, step in between is the machine tool process. Yes. Yeah. You know, uh, machine tools uh, build the, the thruster ball bearings, you know, for turbines uh, in, in, uh, in hydroelectric plants. You know, these are, these are meters and meters and meters in size. Uh, they're complex. They're not simply a round ball bearing, but, you know, it's a, it's a unit. It's a complex unit. Um, that's still going on. The, the exploration of that, the development of that, how to maintain it new materials, new alloys, yes. Okay, so so where do we stand with the US machine tool industry? I mean, it's been widely discussed. LaRouche talked a lot about, for example, the aerospace and the automotive industry as being key uh, reservoirs of the machine tool industry uh, in the United States. And where do we stand now? Well, I think first is the position machine tools within the machinery manufacturing industry, okay. which is a $1.4 trillion global industry. Uh, and we still, the United States, we still export uh, uh, approximately $100, $140 billion um, of worth of machinery uh, to the world. You know, it's a, it's a major positive factor in terms of US balance of trade, but uh, we play a very, still play a very significant role. Machine tools, 
or just say roughly 10% of that, of that, 10% of that global economy uh, of, uh, of machinery production is machine tools themselves. Uh, and in that regard, uh, you know, we've been falling off the cliff uh, since the 19, late 1960s, but really going into the 1970s. We used to export uh, roughly around 30% of all the machine tools, these high performance, the, the top of the line machine tools to the world. We, we were the biggest single producer in the world market. Um, today, we're less than 8% of the world market. Um, uh, to rebuild a U.S. Uh, manufacturing capability, to make the U.S. a superpower in manufacturing again, we would have to increase the number of machine tools being produced. And, and that's not to say, you know, you just punch them out like uh, cookies, uh, you know, with a cookie cutter, but you would, need, you, you would need to quadruple or increase by five-fold or more uh, the size of the machine tool production capabilities of the United States. I mean, how long could we, how long can we continue to be uh, a producer if we're not even producing our own machine tools? So how would you go about doing that? Where, where would you start? I mean. Well, first of all, I think <laughs> there's a lot of different uh, features to that, but uh, first of all, you got to create the demand. Uh, and I think, uh, we've got to increase the demand for the production of machine tools uh, in the United States. Uh, so yes, there's tariffs, of course, but more importantly, uh, we need the kinds of projects in energy, infrastructure, and other areas that will drive the development of new machine tools, you know, utilizing what LaRouche called, Brendan LaRouche called the machine tool principle, this, this trans transfer of new breakthroughs in science uh, into uh, the uh, productive process to drive that forward. Uh, you know, so if there's a demand, well, then there's the capability uh, 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 or can become the capability. Apprenticeships, uh, it's overlooked. It's hard to find U.S. figures. West Germany has 70,000 people working in the machine tool sector. They produce two and a half times as many machine tools, and they're the biggest exporter along with Japan, the biggest exporters to the world. Uh, today. Um, it's hard to even find U.S. figures on the number of people working in the machine tool building, machine tool producing sector itself. Uh, we don't even think about it. We, uh, we only look at the output, but how many workers, how many productive tool and die and skilled machinists do we have? Uh, it's, it's paltry. It's around 400,000 total in terms of the total number of machinists uh, and uh, tool and die, which is the more you know, high-end, productive, skilled end of that uh, process uh, in, in the country. So you, you've got to amplify through apprenticeship programs, mentoring. That means the funds have got to be there, but directed. And the best way to direct them is around projects, grand infrastructure projects. As we talked about before, building 200 uh, gigawatts of additional nuclear power to triple the size of the U.S. manufacturing base, just as a, a single example. That requires, in terms of nuclear industry, uh, a, a tremendous capability beyond, beyond, beyond what we have now. We're producing, at most, one nuclear power plant at a time. And of course, the one we're building right now down in Georgia, uh, actually the two units, that's, those are the first plants in a decade. So if we were to say mass produce nuclear power plants with a standardized design or something like that, that would require a whole bunch of machines to manufacture the parts and so forth for those plants. And then you'd need machine tools to make the machines that would then manufacture the parts for the plant. Do I got that right? Absolutely, absolutely. You got a machine, you know, yes, a tool, yeah, a tool is your fork, you know, when you're eating dinner. But uh, a machine tool, these are powered machines. These are, you know, there's a lot of parts in any one of these and, and, and the tolerances and so forth are, are improving and there's new alloys, new materials. Uh, and that means a new potential products uh, coming out of this process. Uh, and we should be right in the middle of it. We should be leading the way. There's new cutting, cutting surfaces and cutting devices, right? Like lasers, they've switched into laser. Yeah cutting devices and sometimes plasma 
cutting devices, I understand, and also computer computer guided machine tools, which allow for these very tight process, uh, tolerances. Yes, and the hybrid machines that combine subtractive, uh, which is what we're talking about, cutting, drilling, and boring, and so forth, with additive manufacturing, 3D printing, are combined in a single uh, machine, you know, allowing you to do just one setup, you know, with CAD, SAM, or CAD, rather, uh, computer-aided design, you set it all up, and you come out the other side with a product, uh, you know, or a, a finished piece. Uh, uh, so yeah, it, uh, but this requires a very skilled workforce, uh, and we've got to be committed in terms of pay scale uh, to uh, producing that workforce. Absolutely, supporting the families of that of that worker. It requires a little bit more skill than working in an Amazon distribution warehouse, I would imagine. Absolutely. I, you, robotics is a good example. You know, robotics, uh, you know, it's admitted robotics in an Amazon workshop is used to speed workers up. You know, the, the uh, boxes come to them. So they're, they're sitting there, you know, they're, they're, they're like the sorcerer's apprentice, you know, the buckets of water are coming to them one after the other, if you remember the story. Uh, right. You know, as opposed to robotics is part of an integrated manufacturing process. Uh, which of course is part of what advanced uh, machine tool uh, design and and the, uh, and production methods uh, involve. So, in your estimation, what's the biggest bottleneck? Uh, educated workforce. Really, I think it is, and, and, and we don't admit it. We haven't admitted it. Uh, although the Trump administration made a stab in that direction. Really, with a, a only with a space program comparable to what Kennedy did in the '60s, uh, and similar uh, crash program on fusion energy, you know, as we're advocating, the Pack is advocating, could you get a, a driver uh, that would uh, that could get enough people excited, uh, force enough resources, not just money, but it's actual you know material, uh, teachers, so forth, the focus. Uh, in that area to produce that workforce. So I think that's the, the biggest bottleneck, but you've also got to uh, support these companies, uh, lean manufacturing, all the, you know, just in time uh, delivery, all of this has been used to just, you know, cream uh, the, uh, the machine tool sector. But it started in 71, when the dollar went off the gold, gold standard, uh, you know, Nixon's policy, uh, the dollar was devalued, um, uh, uh, machine tool uh, production started bouncing up and down, zigzagging up and down, boom, bust, just like uh, the natural gas or oil industry, uh, and 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 just wreaked havoc uh, in in a in a uh, section of the economy that was absolutely crucial. Um, you know, the uh, 1980s, the Volcker policies, high interest rate policy, a consequence of that was that the Japanese, uh, no fault of their own, but the Japanese took over along with Germany in CNC, a computer numerically controlled machine tool. Uh, we, we had developed the technology, but in the, in the crash of the 1980s, we never you know, basically took that to market. And, uh, and so today, Germany and Japan lead in the most advanced areas of machine tool production. Uh, that was a consequence of effectively shooting ourselves in the foot. So we've got to have the credit, we've got to have the focus, we've got to have a, a drive to build up the productive capabilities of our country again. And that, that means securing the stable conditions for the machine tool sector to grow. So it, it, tell me if I got this right. So on the one hand, you need to increase the demand and, and, and the front end of that would be nuclear power space program uh, also, fusion, which would require the development of new types of machine tools and machining capabilities, and also probably I would imagine in the frontier biotechnology uh, segments, because some of the machines that are involved in in mass producing and and uh, generating these kinds of new biotechnologies have to be extremely precise and extremely um, uh, precision machines. So that. Yeah nanotechnologies and so forth, yeah. Nanotechnologies, material technologies. And then we need to have uh, a shift in the government and 
policy and also uh, credit policy to favor investments in these kinds of things. So for example, tax investment tax credits like yeah. Kennedy or, and, and Trump even tried to propose that, but the Republicans in Congress wanted to have uh, cross the board tax cuts that just yeah. it, financial instruments the same as investments in machinery. Yeah, it's forgotten today largely that Nixon ended the investment tax credit, you know, and, and then went with Keynesian economics which gave us the inflationary bubble, which then, you know, Volcker came along and crashed along with the whole U.S. economy. Um, yeah, so that investment tax credit absolutely uh, is critical. And that's tax something we've been stressing, right, that, you know, both the Keynesian, you know, craziness that you see coming out of the Biden administration, the Democrats right now, and the so-called free trade policy or free market policy that, the Wall Street Republicans have have championed. They're both the same thing. They both don't they don't focus and they actually detract from getting the kind of investments in in something as crucial as machine tools that you're talking about. Yeah. Well, I think that gives our listeners a good a good uh, thing to think about in terms of the importance of machine tools. And I'll I'll post uh, with the video some. Uh, links to articles by LaRouche and also uh, by Brian on some of the economic uh, policies and development pr programs that so you can delve into this in a little more detail. If yeah. you want to add to this uh, before we close? Well, I would just say because it's so mysterious to a lot of people, I would just, you know, go on your search engine and just put in machine tool and, and pull up some videos. Uh, there's a million and one videos by various machine tool companies out there uh, just to get a feel for it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a whole world. That's a good idea. Maybe uh, we can post a few links along uh, 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 in that light to, to our viewers along because oh, the way we're going to get the change in these policies if, is if the citizens start demanding it. Instead of getting sidetracked and making crazy demands about this, that, or the other program they think they want. Uh, you know, if we had a, uh, a, a broad-based political movement that were demanding, you know, an increased investment and development of machine tools, then things would change. You can imagine people out on the streets demanding build more machine tools would be a lot more productive than saying, uh, you know, save the whales or stop cows from emitting methane or something like that. Yeah, this is how you increase productivity. Transfer those new breakthroughs right on through the productive process. The real All right. Process. That's very good. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us for this edition of LPAC Shorts. And we'll sure. to see you soon with uh, some more. Thank you very much.